Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, April 18th. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council. We are going to start our day with two presentations. The first is going to be a proclamation recognizing Earth Day, and that will be led by me. And so I invite everybody who's here for the Earth Day celebration to come on down. Okay, there we go. This thing is on. So uh, I, I'm really excited to be here uh, and celebrate Earth Day. You know, here in Montgomery County, we have made a commitment to eliminating greenhouse gas emissions by reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2027, uh, and to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. And we've been making incredible strides here in Montgomery County. And the way we've been able to do that work is with our partnerships, not only in county government, but with all of our important community groups throughout all 500 square miles of Montgomery County. And so behind me uh, are incredible leaders in our environmental movement, uh, and also Ms. Adriana Hotchberg here. Adriana, come on up. Uh, who not only uh, has worn a number of hats here in Montgomery County, uh, most recently being the acting director of DEP. Prior to that, or in conjunction with that, she has been our climate czarina. Uh, and we're actually losing Adriana. Friday is her last day. Um, but she is carrying forth the work that she's done here in Montgomery County, and she's taking it to the national level, taking it to the EPA. And so our loss here in the county is our nation's gain. Uh, and Adrian, I would love for you to say some words about the work that you've been doing over the last five years and the work that you're going to continue doing. Thank you so much, uh, Council President Glass, for inviting me here today. Um, it is very bittersweet um, to be uh, about to depart the county. Um, it's been um, quite an adventure journey these last four years that sometimes because of the pandemic year felt like you know, an additional several years are tacked into that. Um, but just it, it was really due to all of the collective efforts, uh, not only of you know my wonderful county colleagues, but of all of members of our community who participated together and, and really helped shape um, our um, climate action plan. Um, that it's it's really the community's climate action plan. It's not just Montgomery County's um, climate action plan. Uh, we do have very ambitious uh, climate goals, as we should have. Uh, and now, um, it, you know, comes the hard part. You know, we have we have the plans, we have the goals, we have the commitments. Uh, now we got to implement. Uh, we've been doing some great things uh, uh, in that regard. Uh, in, in, in on many fronts, uh, we have been serving as a model uh, for others uh, across the country and the world uh, on how to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions and increase resiliency uh, while centering our efforts on racial equity and social justice. But there is so much more to be done. Uh, and also, there are many others um, around the country and the world who are also leading, and we're learning from them as well. Uh, so the work continues. Um, and I will still be a Montgomery County resident. And I look forward to you know, cheering on and helping um, any way that I can uh, you know, from, a, from my new role in that regard. So thank you so much. Well, if we could give Adriana a round of applause for her work and her leadership and stewardship. And I know that we'll, we'll all be throwing each other lifelines here in Montgomery County and at the federal level. And also, if you all could come up, I would love for you to introduce yourselves and, and your organizations and, and say the good work that you've been doing. Carl, we'll start with you. Hi, my name is Carl Van Est. Um, I'm with the Muddy Branch Alliance. We've been doing a lot of work on salt throughout the community. Uh, Sergio Obedia, I just joined the board of uh, Friends at Sligo Creek. I'm Ed Murtaugh, also with Friends of Sligo Creek. I'm on the board. Hi, I'm Carl Held of the Montgomery County Climate Action Plan Coalition. Council President Class, we want to thank you for all your leadership and efforts this past year and going forward. Thank you very much. Amanda Farber with Conservation Montgomery, and we've been doing work with the Montgomery County Forest Coalition. 
an easy Baba nature forward, and we've just passed the uh, forest conservation law here in Montgomery County last month. Dave Goodrich, I'm with 350 Montgomery County. Rick Sullivan, 350 Montgomery County. We do work on climate finance, both at the county and the state level. I'm Sarah Morris, I'm Little Falls Watershed Alliance in downtown Montgomery County. I'm board president of Little Falls Watershed Alliance. Thank you for this opportunity. Hi, I'm Shruti Bhatnagar uh, with the Sierra Club. Come on up, Come on up. we'll read the proclamation. And also want to thank uh, Shruti for her leadership, most recently as chair of the local Sierra Club chapter. Act like a dense forest. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. So proclamation from the Montgomery County Council. Whereas Earth Day 2023 is centered around this year's theme, investing in our planet, a reminder of the action that needs to be taken to ensure we leave behind a sustainable world for future generations to come. And whereas we are in a climate emergency, Earth's temperature has risen by approximately two degrees Fahrenheit since 1980, and the 10 warmest years in the historical record have all occurred since 2010. And whereas here in Montgomery County, we set a goal of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 80% in 2027 and achieving 100% reductions by 2035. And whereas we must collectively transition away from a fossil fuel economy, and technologies of the past, and instead redirect our policies and investments to creating a 21st century green economy that restores the health of our planet, protects our natural species, and provides environmental justice for all. And whereas tackling the climate crisis is within our reach and will require communities, businesses, governments, and everyone to work together and implement aggressive strategies for a green future. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby commemorates Earth Day 2023, and be it further resolved that all Montgomery County residents are empowered, engaged, and motivated to take action against climate change. Presented on this, the 18th day of April, signed by me. Congratulations. And let's keep up this effort.
Okay, thank you all for that recognition of Earth Day 2023, and we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're now going to have a proclamation recognizing Holocaust Remembrance Day, and that will be led by Council Vice President Friedson, Council Member Katz, and myself. Wanted to invite our guests up to join us, please. We stand here today once again as a community to bear witness for the lost and for the living to assume our solemn obligation to tell the stories, to share the history, to remember the atrocities of the Holocaust and the people who faced those atrocities, one of the darkest chapters of human history. The magnitude of the loss is so overwhelming it's nearly impossible to comprehend. The six million Jews murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust between 1933 and 1945 is roughly equivalent to every single person living in the state of Maryland. Think about that for a minute. Now consider if we held a moment and a minute of silence for each of those six million Jewish victims, we would be standing here in this chamber in that deafening silence for over 11 years. For their memories to be a blessing, we must remember their names and continue to share their stories. As time goes on and as survivors advance in age, we must record their stories to have them for perpetuity. We must teach our children so that they can pass it on to their children. Today, we are so deeply humbled to be joined by Lou Pohorilis, a survivor who we will hear from shortly, who's joined by his son, Steve. We are once again honored by the presence of Manny Mandel, a member of our extended council family, father of Lisa Mandel Trupp, who has previously shared his stories as a young boy in the Shoah. We're also joined by Robert Lubrin and Zach Trupp and members of the 2G and 3G boards. The lives of these survivors is an extraordinary act of defiance against evil. Each and every day of their lives, of their children and their grandchildren's lives, is a remarkable rebellion against unthinkable oppression. We're also joined by the Jewish Community Relations Council, Deb Miller, Janice Rosenblatt, and the Montgomery County Jewish Educators Alliance, Andrew Winter, and Dr. Mark Cohen. As we remember those who perished and honor those who survived, we stand together in solidarity as a community to condemn anti-Semitism in all of its forms, to combat hatred and to repudiate genocide against anyone, anywhere, and to band together to fight the disease of indifference and say together as a community, never again. With that, I'd like to turn to my colleague first, Council Member Sidney Katz, and then to Council President Evan Glass for a few comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Remembrance Day, is the Jewish Memorial Day for the Shoah commemorated by Jewish communities worldwide. The term Shoah is the Hebrew word for catastrophe, referring to the Holocaust. 
This Remembrance Day is observed from the evening of Monday, April 17th, to the evening of April 18th, tonight. It is observed with services, ceremonies, and testimonials from survivors. We are honored to have with us today survivors of this horrific event in our history. Honoring this day is extremely important, especially considering anti-Semitic incidents in our region, which have become all too common, especially in our schools over the last several months. In our county, anti-Semitic incidents spiked 261 percent, with many of them during school and on school property. In February 2023, nine anti-Semitic incidents were reported with MCPS in the span of one week. Recent anti-Semitic activities reported across the county have ranged from Nazi symbols and other graffiti flyers and anonymous emails all the way to outright physical assault. This Sunday, April 23rd at 1 p.m., there will be a virtual gathering for the Jewish Community Relations Council, also known as JCRC, annual Yom HaShoah commemoration to remember the six million Jews killed during the Holocaust and to pay tribute to the survivors and liberators in our community. It is our responsibility as members of society to keep the memory alive and make sure that history does not repeat itself. Never forget and never again. For Holocaust Remembrance Day, we focus on the six million Jews who were killed. They were signified and identified by the Jewish star affixed to their clothing. Two yellow triangles. We also have to acknowledge the hate that was extended beyond. For the six million Jews, there were another five million who were also killed by Nazis for being different, for being political dissidents, for being LGBTQ, for being ethnic minorities. And this happened only a few decades ago. But we have to remember that the pluralistic society, the open society that we all cherish here in Montgomery County, that we cherish in the United States is at risk. And so this gathering, this day, is as much a remembrance for the six million who died, but a fight and a struggle for the community we want and the community that we need. Thank you so much. Um, the full name of Yom HaShoah is actually uh, Yom HaShoah V'Hagavura, which is Day of Remembrance of the Holocaust and the Heroism. And today we commemorate and we honor both, and we are deeply humbled to have with us a survivor, Lou Pohorilis, who has joined us and is going to share some comments. Thank you, Andy. Council. Thank you for inviting us to witness your issuing the proclamation commemorating Yom HaShoah. You'll have to excuse me sometimes. My voice breaks with the memories. I also want to thank you, Council, for your leadership in providing refuge to immigrants that this country badly needs in its workforce and your work in combating xenophobia and anti-Semitism. I was born in Lvov, Poland, no Lviv, Ukraine. I came to the United States in 1947 as an undocumented, illiterate, 10-year-old Polish-speaking orphan who did not know the alphabet or simple numbers. When I was about five or six, and Germany entered Lvov, my father found separate hiding places for me, for himself, my mother, 
and other members of the family. He subsequently removed me from where I was hidden and placed me with a saintly Polish woman whose name was Anna Boska, who was a deeply devout Catholic. I had to remember that my false Polish name was Zbyszyk Jabonski. She and I traveled through the countryside to a small Polish farm village where she had relatives. It was there that I witnessed and deeply, the deeply traumatic horrors of xenophobia and ethnic cleansing. Many mornings, a horse-drawn wagon would go to a nearby, very small Polish farm and bring back the bodies of women, men, and children slaughtered during the night by Ukrainians for burial in a churchyard. To this day, I am equally as haunted by those sites as I am by the times that I spent hiding in love. Before that, in love, I had lived in a crowded attic, endured hunger, and that's my most vivid recollection, hernia surgery without anesthesia, lice, and fear of discovery. Sometimes, I guess, in early 1943, Anna Bosco was shipped by rail cattle car for slave labor in Germany and brought me with her. She was made to work as a cook on a large German farm. I lived there with her. She later had to work at a Krupp munitions factory, though we still lived on the farm. Then German soldiers and tanks moved onto the farm, and after a time we hid in a cellar while we listened to the noise of war. Excuse me. One morning we came out of the cellar to see dozens of field graves consisting of dirt and rocks covering the bodies of fallen soldiers. After that trauma, Anna Bosca and I were, <coughs> excuse me, that's why I don't do this often, I break. Overjoy joined, not only, not only were we free, but the conquering troops accompanying the Brits were Polish paratroopers. And after all, I consider myself a Polish boy. We were transferred to a DP camp in that region and lived there for several years. To shorten the long story, my father's brother, my Uncle Oscar, found and reclaimed me in 1947. I was 10 years old and brought me to New York with a transit visa for the ultimate destination of the Dominican Republic. Who knows, had I continued on to the Dominican Republic, I might have become a baseball player. <laughs> <laughs> Through a private law passed by Congress, I was permitted to stay in the United States. I also made, excuse me, I ultimately learned that the Holocaust brooded and he claimed my parents and all of, almost all of my relatives. Among those killed were my grandparents on both sides. There are many siblings, three of my father's brothers and their families, my mother's two brothers, many cousins and other members of an extended family. Each of those lost lives had a story of brutal treatment and execution by various means, either by Germans or the Ukrainian Nazi collaborators. Because I was illiterate when I came to New York, I was placed in a boarding Jewish day school, taught Judaism, and graduated from the eighth grade with a, the American Legion Medal awarded for scholarship to one eighth grader. 
I supported myself by waiting on tables in the Catskill Mountains while I was attending high school and college in New York. I came to Washington for law school, worked as a lawyer, founded a law firm, and am retired from a successor of that firm. Also in the 1960s, I became very active in Prince George's and Maryland democratic politics, held a number of offices in uh, various political local parties and governmental agencies. I moved to Montgomery County 40 years ago. I've been married to my wife Libby for 62 years. We have three children, one of whom Steve is here. Uh, my daughter Sharon is today, probably right now, talking about my life to a thousand students at Choate School. And my wife Libby and I have been married now 62 years. Thank you. Thank you for honoring us with your story. We're now going to read uh, the proclamation. Before we do, I wanted to acknowledge Ron Halber from the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington has joined us as well. Uh, and with that, uh, we are going to read uh, the proclamation. Montgomery County Council, Montgomery County, Maryland proclamation, whereas the Holocaust was the state-sponsored systematic persecution and annihilation of European Jews by Nazi Germany and its collaborators between 1933 and 1945. Jews were the primary target of the genocide. Six million were murdered. However, other ethnic and religious groups also were victimized and killed. And whereas pursuant to a 1980 act of Congress, United Holocaust Memorial Council designated days of remembrance each year to recall and reflect on the horrific crimes committed during the Holocaust and to ensure that the memory and legacy of those who were murdered will never be forgotten and whereas we have a collective responsibility to those who perished as well as to those who survived to educate current and future generations and rededicate ourselves to teaching the history of the Holocaust and explaining its continued impact on the world and Whereas, as our ability to learn firsthand from survivors will soon be impossible, we must ensure that their stories are shared and documented, and that we continue to educate young people so they can carry the history forward for future generations, and so that this unthinkable chapter of inhumanity is not doomed to repeat itself. And whereas on Sunday, April 23rd, 2023, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Greater Washington will host a virtual community-wide Holocaust Remembrance Commemoration, Yom HaShoah, to honor the lives of the six million Jews killed and the survivors and liberators among us, and to call to mind their courage, forbearance, and strength, and whereas anti-Semitism has spanned for millennia, and unfortunately, it persists today with anti-Jewish hate and bias incidents alarmingly at an all-time high, with a total of 3,697 incidents reported nationwide. And whereas with reported anti-Semitic incidents up 98% from the previous year, Maryland's 109 reported incidents in 2022 ranked 10th highest in the country with Montgomery County representing nearly 60% of anti-Semitic incidents reported, with trends continuing into 2023, including nine anti-Semitic events occurring at Montgomery County Public Schools within the span of only a week. And whereas the County Council unanimously passed a resolution on November 1st, 2022, to address and combat anti-Semitism, pledging to support Jewish residents who make up 10% of Montgomery County's population. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland hereby recognizes Tuesday, April 18th, 2023 as Holocaust Remembrance Day, Yom HaShoah in Montgomery County, and be it therefore further resolved that all residents are urged to recommit themselves to not bear silent witness to injustice and to always remain vigilant to the principles of a just society presented on this 18th day of April in the year 2023 by Council President Evan Glass, Council Member Sidney Katz, and myself, Council Vice President Andrew Friedson. Okay, thank you all for joining us this morning. And while it might seem that the presentations and the proclamations, the two of which we presented this morning were different, uh, the commonality is that we have a lot of work to do to make sure that everybody is healthy and safe in our community. 
And so with that, we're now going to move on to general business. Madam Clerk, do we have any announcements? Yes, good morning, Council President, Council Vice President, Council Members. We have no agenda or calendar changes to announce today. Thank you. Very good, and there are no minutes to approve this week either, so we are going to move on with our work session on the FY23 to 28 Capital Improvements Program, and we are going to start with Montgomery College. So we see Dr. Williams and his team, if they could come on up, and Mr. Howard and Ms. Hussain. And this is a continuation of the work that we've been doing over the last number of months with the uh, second round of uh, budget reductions to the CIP uh, as transmitted by the county executive. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, Mr. Jawando. Thank you, President Glass, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here two days in a row. You get extra credit. Um, <laughs> Uh, as was mentioned, we're going to take up the uh, Montgomery College uh, CIP uh, as well, and then we'll obviously get into MCPS after. Um, before I turn it to staff, just want to thank Dr. Williams and his team for being great partners. Um, just that always continuing a tradition of coming in and being under budget or on budget and, and being very uh, helpful as we deal with a challenging CIP uh, off year. Um, and so, uh, this year is uh, 35, 34.53 million uh, for the CIP for the college, including technical amendments, which is for college-wide library renovations, facility planning, design and construction, as well as the Germantown uh, Student Services Center. Um, and the committee approved the college's technical amendments uh, for the renovations and the initial non-recommended cuts for $6 million for the student center in Germantown. Uh, to address the affordability challenges that we have in the CIP. Um, thank, thankful to the state delegation, just want to say that, uh, that has worked hard to bring additional state aid uh, to the college in support of the capital projects. God bless you. Um, both the library and service center have split the funding that has come from the state, and the staff will talk about that. Uh, and then just yesterday, we considered the second round of, of nine recommended reductions uh, that the college was asked to put forward. Um, and these are targeted uh, to impact the G Germantown Student Service Center project only. And we talked about the impact that a delay here uh, could, could have on the project that has been delayed uh, or in the CIP for 16 years. Um, and uh, the co in light of that, the committee approved unanimously uh, to, point restore, uh, to accept initially that not recommended reduction, but to prioritize it as a high priority for restoration. Uh, in the CIP reconciliation process. So I want to ask uh, staff if I missed anything there, and if not, we'll turn to Dr. Williams and his team for any comment. The only thing I want to make sure we mention is that the committee, as part of the March 16th uh, work session, did approve the executive's recommendation mm -hmm. that two amendments, <clears throat> excuse me, submitted by the college, additional funding for the East County Campus Project and a new Rockville Theater Arts Building renovation project do not meet the biannual CIP criteria, so they weren't approved as part of the, the college's request. Uh, but of course, they are issues that the council, committee and council can come back to in the full CIP next year. But other than that, you've covered everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our staff for such a great job, as well as our year-long fellow. Uh, Dr. Williams, any comments you want to make? Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Jamando and, and Council President Glass. And, uh, thank you for your team again for the, the continued good work on the, the analysis and the packet. I'd be remiss if I didn't just uh, uplift a few things for for the en entire council. Um, I'm definitely grateful for the committee's initial approval of the college's budget as originally recommended by the county executive with that, that $6 million reduction. Um, just to take a moment to kind of highlight that the requests are, are reasonable and, and fair that are, that are in front of you. Uh, for example, the library renovations are they're just that. They are renovations. Um, they're not teardowns as initially in, envisioned. Um, in terms of the Germantown campus, uh, that was strategically rolled in to a larger project that included a student service center. So when Chair Joando talks about that, um, I just would like the entire council to you know, really consider that um, additional component um, in terms of that 
2.9 from those uh, geo bonds that can only impact Germantown Student Services Center, which has that library, and it really it puts this project at extreme risk. And what this project means is educational access and success. Educational access and success situated in one of our the growing parts of our county. Educational access and success situated in um, the most ethnically diverse part of our county and the country. Um, so, and, and at risk at a time where, as you heard from Chairman Jamondo, that our, our county delegation has advocated and you know, was able to bring home $7 million um, in additional funding for this project to move forward on time. And we have those dedicated funds you know, from the state thanks to our county delegation. So um, this Student Services Center is, um, with that library component, is, is so critical. And um, when we think about having financial aid and registration and advising and so many of the components that create a seamless transition to and through post-secondary education for, for our residents who will be students, this is the impact of this project, this project that has been in the CIP for, as you heard, and I want to reemphasize, six, 16 years. This project that will help us more equitably serve our residents and ensure that more residents become students. So we want to work together to launch this project on time. Um, one last thing I will say is that our, uh, our operating request is also fair and reasonable. It's a maintenance of effort request. So we, we take that in totality when you consider um, our, our capital request. And uh, the, we know that you have a, a mountain of thoughts and decisions that need to be made. And um, they're all complex. Montgomery College continues to stand uh, with everyone here and are thankful for your support. We will continue to be the community's college serving more than 40,000 students a year, 80% of whom identify as an individual of color, 50% of the MCPS students who stay in the state attend Montgomery College. Approximately one in five of our students are parenting. Um, these are the, the residents and the students who Montgomery College serves and we're seeking to, as we always have, really continue to support the county. So I, I thank the opportunity to say a few words. Chairman, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Williams, and eloquently stated. So back to you, Mr. President, it was a 3 -0 recommendation to accept it reluctantly, but also ask that we put it as a high priority for restoration. Very good. Um, thank you, Chair Jawando. Thank you, Dr. Williams, uh, for the context uh, about the work that we are doing and, and more importantly the work that you are doing uh, and why it is so critical to our community's current status and future as well. Um, Mr. Howard, uh, do you have any additional comments to make? No, nothing else. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, Council Member Stewart. Thank you. I just want to thank Dr. Williams for being here and to thank the Education and Culture Committee. I know these are very difficult decisions and I appreciate it. Um, for me personally, I, I wish there was something higher than high priority that we could earmark this for our reconciliation list. I very much appreciate the work that Montgomery College has done and what a great partner you've been in this. Um, and I know we're talking about this and we're going to have MCPS up in a moment. I want to remind my colleagues that on Monday, the Government Operations and Fiscal Policy Committee will be taking up and discussing recordation tax, which goes directly towards thinking about how we are going to be funding our CIP. So I just wanted to thank you personally and remind my rest, rest of my colleagues that that's coming up on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Sales. Thank you, President Glass, and thank you, President Williams, for your remarks. Um, last month, Montgomery College earned the number one spot in the state of Maryland in Nisha's Community College Rankings for 2023. The school was also ranked 77th out of 906 eligible colleges nationwide, putting it in the top 15% nationwide. This is not something that we should take for granted. Montgomery College has had a tremendous impact on our students and our faculty, 
and they offer a significant return on our county's investment. Their state-of-the-art facilities allow the college to provide the key resources our young people need to thrive and prosper. They have over 17,000 students enrolled in the college, with more than half being black and brown. When we talk about the Germantown campus specifically, we are talking about a place that's home to a richly diverse community of more than 6,000 students that also host signature programs in biotechnology and cybersecurity. Access to a high quality library is essential to ensure these students acquire the proper skills to return their investment in our county. If this decision were left to me, I would not cut any funds in the CIP for Montgomery College. Since the Education and Culture Committee has stated they will look for opportunities to fund these cuts in the reconciliation list, I am requesting that the council support restoring the $8.9 million in the CIP. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I first want to thank Montgomery College for all the fabulous work that you do. Uh, we, we understand the great asset that Montgomery College is, and uh, particularly our Germantown campus, and I can't thank you enough for, for everything that you do. I also want to thank the uh, Education and Culture Committee for really understanding the value and importance of the Germantown Student Ser uh, Services Center. A and I know that it's a very difficult decision that you made. And um, and I, and I understand that given where we are in the in the budget, um, and thank you, Councilmember Sales, for so eloquently putting the the great need for this uh, student services center. Um, so I just um, I, I want to stress uh, what Dr. Williams said: 16 years. It's been delayed for 16 years, um, and so. I accept that it's on the reconciliation list. I accept that it's a high priority. But at some point, we need to build this building. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you to my colleagues. Um, thank you to the Education and Culture Committee for undertaking this, this difficult task. Uh, and with that, I don't see any other comments. So we will support uh, without objection the recommendations of the ENC Committee. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams and your team. <laughs> Next, we will turn to MCPS, and I invite Dr. McKnight, Superintendent McKnight, and her team to come on down, along with Mr. Levchenko and Ms. McGuire. And Board of Education President, Ms. Silvestre, welcome. And similar to the conversation with Montgomery College, tough decisions regarding our CIP and the declining revenue. Um, but again, I appreciate the, the tough task that the Education and Culture Committee undertook. And I will turn it over once again to the chair. Thank you, Mr. President. And good morning uh, to our MCPS partners and, and staff and the millions watching at home. Um, the Board of Education's amended uh, FY23 to 28 CIP requests is a total of $1.94 billion, an increase of $165.7 million over the approved CIP. Um, of this total, $91 million is attributable to construction and inflationary cost increases for seven previously approved CIP projects. I just think that's an important point that I found this on the web. Siri agrees that's an important point that the vast majority of this is attributable to uh, construction and inflationary cost uh, as opposed to new projects. The committee uh, held three CIP work sessions related to MCPS and reviewed the overarching issues such as enrollment, uh, demographic trends, construction costs, as well as a project by project review of the requested amendments and non recommended reductions, which we'll talk about momentarily. The committee's <coughs> recommendations were as follows, um, and then we'll hear from uh, President Silvestri and, and Dr. McKnight, uh, as well as staff. The committee tentatively approved the board's requested project amendments, including cost increases for the approved projects, increased funding and scope for a new Burtonsville Elementary School, uh, funding for the materials management warehouse re, uh, relocation, 
uh, and requested increases in systemic projects. Uh, the committee supported these amendments pending final affordability considerations. Uh, in addition, the committee considered non-recommended reductions requested to reflect the current shortfalls we have uh, due to the council's uh, uh, deficit in there and the write down and recordation tax. And as was mentioned by Chair of GO Committee, the, we have an opportunity to do something about that. Uh, the committee recommends the following. Uh, do not accept the non-recommended, we did not accept the non-recommended reduction for the Americans with Disabilities, ADA Compliance Project. We think that needs to stay on track. That was $2 million in FY24. We accepted the non-recommended reductions in the Roof Replacement Project, uh, $4 million in FY27 and 28, and the Sustainability Initiatives Pro Project, $2.5 million in FY24. Uh, we retain for further consideration all other non-recommended reductions as needed, uh, pending affordability at context at reconciliation. Um, the non-recommended reductions, just want to call out, included a two-year delay of the Damascus High School project and a one-year delay that we took up yesterday to the Magruder High School project. Um, and uh, we were not happy about that. Um, and just want to remind colleagues that this is an amendment year. Um, and next year we're going to have the full CIP, uh, and so we're going to have to be really aware of all of these projects as we move forward. It's going to be a challenge, um, and the blueprint impl implementation also has implications on future CIP projects. So um, we're going to need to discuss all these revenue adjustments. It's going to be critical, uh, but I want to turn uh, first here to um, any opening comments from uh, President Silvestri. Uh, just to give an order for colleagues, then we'll go to Dr. McKnight uh, for brief comments, then we'll get a fiscal summary from Mr. Levchenko um, and a description of the, uh, uh, I just did the description of the board's request, so we won't do that again. Uh, but then we we'll, can go, Mr. President, to Q&As from council members. So just want to give that overview and then turn it over to uh, President Silvestri. Good morning, Council President Glass and members of the Montgomery County Council. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Board of Education's requested FY24 capital budget and amendments to the FY23-28 capital improvements program. As we continue to talk about the critical work embedded within our operating and capital budgets, we recognize that this work cannot occur without the strong commitment of this county council. We recognize that our request is higher than what was previously approved totaling $1.936 billion. However, this request does not represent additional projects, but rather keeps pace with inflationary pressures and market conditions. We continue to face unprecedented vacancies, inflation, rising interest rates, and supply chain issues, all of which have impacts on our capital programs. I understand the Council faces difficult decisions this spring when it comes to funding the various budgets, but I'm here today to ask for you to consider the full funding of our request. As we navigate the CIP process, I acknowledge that you have requested two rounds of non-recommended reductions due to the County Executive's recommended CIP. While the Board of Education stands by its original request, I do understand why these funding reductions are, options are necessary. These non-recommended reductions represent delays to major projects that our communities have been patiently <coughs> waiting for for several years. I thank Committee Chair Jawando and members of the Education and Culture Committee for recognizing the importance of all of our CIP projects, including the ones identified in the non-recommended reductions and for supporting further consideration of these reductions based on affordability and review during reconciliation. The total reduction request of $87.7 million is significant, and this request is not for new projects, but for increases in cost to existing projects. Therefore, any reduction from our request translates into delays and continued challenges faced by our schools due to our aging infrastructure. I appreciate your time today and look forward to our continued partnership as we navigate these challenging times and tough decisions. Thank you for all you do and for your continued support 
for Montgomery County Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, President Sylvester. Dr. Mack. Great. Uh, good morning, President Glass. Good morning to council members. It's so nice to see you all. I believe this is my first time here in person since the new county council has been installed. So very good to, uh, to see you in person. Many of you I've had an opportunity to speak to over Zoom and other meetings just to, to uh, get acquainted. So I am thrilled to be here this morning. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about our um, capital budget for the fiscal year 23 to 28. Um, it is definitely one that is important to us and we have to take much consideration in terms of Montgomery County Public Schools representing the school system that has a fast growing population that we must always be prepared for. Um, and to be, speak more specifically about that, MCPS has seen a steady increase of student enrollment since 2007 up to 2008. Um, the official enrollment for September 30th was actually 160,554 students. Now, we always recognize that September 30th is important because that is when we report our current enrollment to the state and they fund us based on those numbers. Um, but with that said, we now have received more, uh, more students. Our current enrollment takes into consideration that this year our enrollment has increased by 2,322 students. So we are back, and we are back from the impact of the pandemic in which that was a time over the last two years in which we did see a slowdown in enrollment. And to even be more specific with you, um, I last checked our enrollment on March 15th. We were at 162,467. So just in one year's time, we've received over 2,000 more students. And so um, I, I share that with you because we should continue to prepare for the future as we think about CIP, because as those students come into Montgomery County, we must find a classroom and a school space to can to, that can accommodate their needs, um, and we must be prepared for that. As I think about projections for the future, total school enrollment projection is looking to increase to over 167,000 um, by 20, uh, 2028 and 2029. So if you think about that, we are projecting anywhere between one to 2,000 over the next few years. And that takes into consideration that we have had some slowdown over the past few years. My belief is that we're going to recover quickly because every indication of the current enrollment says that is the case. Um, now, one other piece that I'd like to bring to you before we get into discussion is, uh, not only have we been impacted by enrollment during the pandemic, but we've also been impacted in other ways that we have not in the past by construction. So the supply chain has been one that has impacted us greatly, um, not being able to get the materials as quickly as we would want to and would like to as we have in the past when construction has started, not to mention the price changes in the materials that we have to purchase. In some cases, through over the last couple of years due to the pandemic impacts, We've had to increase the funding for a project. In some cases, sometimes it looks almost double when you have to take into consideration the cost and inflation that's happening over that time. But we're committed to not starting a project in Montgomery County and not finishing it. So that means we have to think about ways in which we make the adjustments so that we can accommodate those costs. So in order to maintain the completion dates of previously approved projects, and as Ms. Silvestri mentioned, um, aging infrastructure, it was necessary to increase the adopted budgets for several of our individual capital projects and our countywide plan. So I just wanted to elevate those things for you because those are pieces that I think have stood out for construction specifically for us over the, over the past few years, um, which has put us where we are today with our CIP. Thank you so much. I am joined here today also by our Chief Operating Officer, Brian Hall, and our Director of Facilities and Construction, who you know, Mr. Adams. So with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. I uh, appreciate the context um, and want to turn it over to uh, Mr. Levchenko to give a fiscal update. As I mentioned in committee, we went through project by project. And uh, as uh, Keith often reminds us, the CIP is a three-dimensional object. And uh, we're trying to uh, figure out how all the pieces fit in light of potential new revenues and everything that's going on. So. Uh, Mr. Levchenko will give us an overview, and then I think, Mr. President, back to you for questions from colleagues. Well, you did cover some of it, so um, I won't revisit that. Just a, a, a few points um, uh, to note. In the board request, uh, you had mentioned Burtonsville Elementary School, uh, and that is a, a scope change where they're looking at relocating the school rather than rebuilding on site. Uh, so there's a significant 
cost element to that that's in the board request. Uh, the committee expressed strong support for that project with the new scope, but I just wanted to mention that that is one exciting new item in the in the CIP. It's not all just uh, cost increases. There are some elements. Um, also in the um, uh, non-recommended reductions, uh, uh, these stem from the executive's affordability reconciliation project that came over with with his initial round of amendments in January. Uh, the first round for the schools uh, to get closer to the executive's recommended funding level uh, totaled about $51 million in the six-year period. And as you mentioned, we have the annual issues as well, but just focusing on the six-year for now. Um, and then the round two cuts, which as you noted were related to the write-down in recordation tax revenue, that was another $31.5 million uh, that they were asked to find. Uh, so the round one and round two cuts were about $82 million uh, in the six-year period. So that's a pretty daunting task um, that we asked them uh, to do to come back with, you know, non-recommended reductions. Don't want to, uh, you want to make sure that we understand those are not recommendations from uh, NCPS to, to do these reductions. They were, they were asked to say how you could get to the lower funding level, what would it take? Uh, and that was what they were able to provide to us. Uh, so I wanted to clarify that. Uh, and also, um, and you alluded to this as well, um, this is not a full CIP year. Uh, next year we will be looking at across the entire CIP and all projects will be revisited, uh, especially in terms of cost. Uh, so not just in the schools, but elsewhere in the CIP, but particularly in the schools, uh, we expect that uh, projects that are in, in the CIP now will be revisited and very likely may be subject to additional cost increases uh, since some of those projects, their estimates will have been a couple of years old by then. Um, so we, we are uh, cognizant that, uh, yes, we'll balance things this year, but we will also still have a significant challenge next year with the schools and with, with uh, across county government. Uh, so that's important. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to note in the um, in the round one uh, reductions, uh, you had mentioned um, uh, Damascus High School, and then Magruder was a round two reduction. Um, also in the round one reductions was uh, Highland View Elementary School addition was also uh, uh, would be deferred two years as well. So I just wanted to uh, to note that. Um, and a couple of uh, next steps. Obviously, we have the reconciliation project uh, uh, over the next month. Um, we also have to address uh, and reconcile with the state aid um, approvals from the, the recently concluded state legislative session. Uh, we don't have that prepared today, but that is something we'll have to work with what was approved versus what we already are assuming, and what does that mean for the out years of the CIP as well. Uh, so that will be uh, factored in. Um, uh, you'd also mentioned the, the recordation tax bill. Uh, the outcome of that will affect the reconciliation project uh, process as well. Um, I think that's about all I wanted to add to uh, your initial fiscal summary, and I, I think staff and MCPS and, and board president are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. President, I just want to make one, just to be put a bow on it, just to be clear. We did not recommend the ADA compliance project. We asked for that to be restored. We didn't accept that change. Uh, we accepted the roof replacement and sustainability, and then we retained for further consideration, which is a nice way of saying we know it has to be considered in the overall project, but um, we're not suggesting that it should be accepted, the, the major projects like Magruder and Damascus and, and Highland View. So just wanted to be clear about where we put that. We know it's in the mix, but we didn't recommend it. So thank you. Back to you. I appreciate that terminology. I think it is something that we could use moving forward across the board. Uh, so, so thank you for uh, for for using it in in, in this context. Um, I have some thoughts, but we'll first turn it over to colleagues and first turn it over to Councilmember Ludke. Thank you, Mr. President. And obviously, I have two schools on the cuts list here, on the delay list here, that are in my district. And to be clear, Damascus High School has not had a refresh even since 1978, which was before most of the ENC committee was born. It is, it is astounding that this part of the county has been repeatedly shoved to the back of the line. 
And I know Mr. Adams attended the meeting with me out there that we held at Damascus High School where we heard from all the families and we heard about, of course, the ongoing growth in the Clarksburg area, which is, of course, pushing because Clarksburg High School can only hold so many, Damascus can only hold so many, and we have to do our best to balance out there in the northwestern part of the county for our residents. But I think the thing that struck me the most was the next day, being at my child's lacrosse practice where he was having a scrimmage and hearing some folks who didn't know I was the council member who represented District 7 talking about how the people on the council do not care about them at all and disregard them and do not think about geographic diversity, which I know is something that both Council Member Balcom and I have repeatedly been advocating for since we got sworn in, because we've been hearing it nonstop from the up county, because it has been an issue, and decisions that this body has been making over the years have not been reflective of all parts of the county equally at all. Um, and, you know, right now, the proposed change would put Damascus High School two years behind, another two years behind, um, and Magruder another year behind, or sorry, Damascus, uh, Magruder one year, but it was already delayed two years before for those of us who were new. It was just delayed in the 2021-22-ish area, and someone who's sitting up here in the panel can, can tell me the exact date, but it, it wasn't that long ago and it just got bumped again. Um, and we really, really have to do better. And I know MCPS was put in a tough position of having to make the non-recommended cuts because of, of how the, the budget was done. And I know that we made a recommendation as a body to put PAYGO into the CIP to help keep things on track. And that was not what the county executive chose to do. So that put MCPS in a tough situation. Um, but I really, I really truly hope that we do focus on balance and equity and prioritization as a whole for the county and make sure we include that geographic diversity as a part of that analysis so that we are not persistently putting the up county to the back of the line. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, next, council member Fani Gonzalez. Good morning. Um, yes, first time we see you here, at least since we have uh, been on the county council. A uh, couple of things. One, I uh, appreciate all your work from the Education and Culture Committee. Highland View Elementary School cannot be delayed. I've been to that school so many times, and it will be um, really bad to do that to them. Um, and that's in my community, too. Uh, the other issue I wanted to highlight is the ADA compliance. When my kids were at uh, Kim Mill Elementary School, uh, one of my kids had a friend in his class who was in a wheelchair. And I think we usually undermine or don't think about the needs of kids who's, who are facing disabilities. And um, it would not meet our values as a county if we get pushing back ADA compliance issues. So thank you for all your work on that as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, and, and the chair of the GEO committee mentioned it before, we need money. We need to raise a lot of money, folks, to be able to afford facilities that actually meet our standards and help our teachers and our students or staff to succeed. When I became chair of the Economic Development Committee, I started talking about our schools because I really love them and care for them. I wanna make sure that our kids are successful and they have everything they need because they are the future workforce. I wouldn't be doing my job if I don't make sure that our facilities meet that value. Um, I just came back from Taiwan and I think I'm gonna be saying this for the next year, so bear with me. Um, I was there with a county executive and it was amazing to meet a whole bunch of scientists from Asia, not just Taiwan, Asian general, um, who said to us that they lived in Montgomery County and that their parents brought them in Montgomery County because of the schools. I met a whole bunch of people there who went through Mongoli Montgomery College, the University of Maryland, people who ended up working at NIH and all the amazing uh, federal agencies that we have here in Montgomery County working on, on scientific research. 
and then went back to Asia. Um, but uh, the reason that why they came here was because of our schools. And that, all, and that doesn't just mean the quality of teachers that we have, and we're gonna have the conversation on teachers in that budget later on, but focusing on the CAP and the facilities, it has to match that value. Um, so I'm just putting a hint of what I'm gonna do in the future <laughs> um, on the budget. And uh, the last thing I wanna say to you, since you're here, Dr. McKnight, you know, especially from my work in parking planning, I think the first time you met me was when you were not a uh, uh, superintendent and I was on the planning board and my passion about making sure our buildings for an NCPS, and I have said this here before, really had to meet the standards that we have nowadays. Buildings need to be closer to the street and it's just very frustrating to continue seeing uh, facilities from MCPS not doing what the planning department is recommending. recommending. So I'm just taking the opportunity to tell you, please work with us on this. Um, Northwood is, is coming up and it's in my district and I really wish we can have a, if you can follow the planning board recommendations on this. Um, not because I want to, but because it's, it's a trend. It's, it's, we want to have pedestrian safety, cyclist safety, and that means the buildings need to be arranged in a certain way. Um, and the other last thing I will say, uh, um, I am an environmentalist, and I hate synthetic turf, and you know that too. Uh, we need to keep promoting natural grass, and I've been working with your staff. You probably don't even know this, but I am working with your staff, and they have been wonderful on making sure our your facilities have uh, more natural grass uh, because it's not just good for the environment, but it's also great for the students and um, the soccer plex and Montgomery parks. Uh, they are an ally for you on this. They have the expertise and the research. We just need to be working closer on this. Um, and I just wanted to put that in and thank you so much for all your work and the staff for their amazing report. Uh, it was very clear. And um, uh, thank you again for all your work, uh, Chair uh, Jawando. Thank you, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here today. Um, uh, a couple things I wanted to to really emphasize what uh, uh, Councilmember Ludke was talking about because we have seen incredible delays <laughs> in some of these up county projects. Um, and um, you know, Damascus was one that I emphasized in the committee hearing that uh, it's really uh, alarming to see that on the chopping block again. Um, and Councilmember Ludke had submitted a memo to, to that regard as well. But that was certainly you know one that you know, we were distressed to see on the list as well. Um, and, and it does go to show the way that these increased costs, uh, the way that inflation has hit even without adding projects, that we have just been put in a really uh, quite untenable position. Um, and I also, Mr. Levchenko had mentioned uh, Burtonsville Elementary School um, and shifting it to the, to the new location and costs that are associated with that. And I wondered, uh, Mr. Adams, if you could speak to that briefly again, just to explain uh, the reason for that and the fiscal benefit uh, of doing that relocation and freeing up the original building? Sure, absolutely. As, as we discussed in education and culture, you know, we, we really took a, a strong look at all of our projects in, in a way that's going to be most fiscally responsible. So um, when we looked at the Burtonsville, obviously there's a great need from a Burtonsville Elementary School standpoint, uh, but there's also a, a great need for facility, public facilities in that part of the county. Um, so when we looked at a variety of projects that are happening, uh, I'll just give you an example, Greencastle Elementary Edition is, is ongoing. That project had a component around pre-K, um, special education, uh, but there's also a larger need than just at Greencastle. So as we considered either increasing budgets around Greencastle um, or looking at other options, it's actually much more cost effective than to, to build a new Burtonsville, provide the services that the Burtonsville community needs. Um, divert some of those costs at Greencastle um, to the old Burtonsville building and really look at that as a, a facility that can that can um, span multiple uses but but really uh, trying to use every dollar to its maximum extent. Um, so that's just one example of, of what we looked at in terms of of trying to find a really good sweet spot um, in this overall CIP. So an increased cost in one project actually um, nets uh, you, you know, uh, less cost on other projects and, and really finding a, a, a good balance as we move forward. 
Thank you, that's helpful. Um, and uh, Dr. McNutt, I feel like, are you leaning towards the button there? Did you want to? Yes, I did thank just you. want to add, thank you, Mr. Adams, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, that actually was a perfect example because as we relieve uh, Greencastle and are able to utilize the current Burtonsville building, which wouldn't be the new Burtonsville, it also allows us the opportunity to take on some of the responsibility that we're required to do in the blueprint. Um, mm -hmm. We do have to drastically increase, as we should, pre-K enrollment in Montgomery County. And so we've been very thoughtful about where we need more pre-K programs across the county um, to make sure that we're meeting everyone's needs. And we're also thinking about how we can utilize current facilities like in this situation versus trying to build uh, more facility for pre-K because we actually won't be able to build our way out of this for what we're expected to produce in terms of the number of seats for pre-K. So that was a great example. Um, one, other ex one other piece I'd just like to highlight for Burtonsville Elementary, that is the only school within this county does th that does not have a direct access to the school without uh, being situated behind a um, shopping center. So the location actually just does not work for that purpose of a comprehensive uh, elementary school. Um, and so when we think about relocation, we also took some things into consideration like that as an example. Um, but again, when we head off the cost for pre-K from Greencastle Elementary, as you think about fiscally, it does allow us to be able to, to balance out there some other financial need that may have been, attack, that may have been attached to the Greencastle project specifically for pre-K. Thank you. Thank you for that <clears throat> uh, additional framing. And uh, and I think what this conversation really goes to show is that, uh, you know, it's so, we have so many critical projects that are in danger because of these increased costs. And it's just, um, I mean, this this is our work, but it's also to a, there, there's a point where you're just like, I, I cannot compare the urgency of these many years long, decade, decade plus long projects that our community is crying out for. And it is, uh, you know, incumbent on us to find a solution. And so I really appreciate uh, the, the upcoming work of the GEO committee. Um, and, and I look forward to participating in that conversation and to supporting the work as we as we look for new revenue streams, because we're now in a position where because of these increased costs, we have incredibly important projects uh, that just have to get done in the longer we delay them, of course, um, that impacts the community, but it's also going to continue to escalate to escalate costs, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be impacting costs on our operation side also as we try to deal with what those delays look like on the ground. Um, so it's just an important conversation, and, and I look forward to supporting the work of the GEO committee on that. Um, and then I also just wanted to note that, um, you know, as we look at the CIP and really Related revenue streams, um, it, it's easier to see exactly what we're getting for those taxpayer funds, right? Because it comes with these very detailed project descriptions. Um, we're able to say, uh, you know, this funding is going to result in this being built or this being repaired, you know, down the street from you, and then taxpayers will see those buildings uh, go up and so on. Um, it's trickier on the operating side. Right, it's it's less tangible. It's it's less visible. Obviously, our students and our staff um, see that every day as they're participating in that environment. But it's harder to to uh, have you know the visual representation of that for the for the public. So I just wanted to really encourage you know the Board of Education and Dr. McKnight um, when we get to the operating budget discussions uh, in in committee tomorrow over the next few weeks to be very very specific as much as is possible about why MCPS is requesting uh, so much money over MOE um, and you know how the thinking that you put into it, the programming that we're going to see, I think that level of specificity uh, becomes even more important as we're looking at these very, uh, as these very large numbers. Um, and the, the need is very great, right? And we know that you all have been having these discussions on your side in great detail. As much of that uh, that we can bring in front of the public and to be as transparent as possible is going to be really helpful so that both the council uh, and the public are able to understand you know, exactly why we're being asked to raise taxes taxes, um, what exactly we're getting by directing additional funds to MCPS, the more we can uh, paint a very clear picture the way we're able to kind of naturally do on the CIP side, that's going to be really helpful in our conversations as well. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I, I will add uh, and echo the, the comments made by Council Member Fani Gonzalez uh, regarding 
the actual construction and design of these buildings. Uh, this year, as we are taking up amendments to the CIP, uh, we will next year look at the totality of the projects. And I think uh, it's important to lay the marker now that as we are looking at uncertain revenue for these types of projects, it requires us to think differently about the projects we design and ultimately build. And best practices from uh, across the country and from uh, communities much like Montgomery County, where we have urban, suburban, and even rural schools, um, or schools that serve different types of communities, I think having uh, a monolithic type of project for schools um, hinders us. I think it makes it inflexible to our budget uh, and inflexible to the land use as it surrounds those types of communities um, or is particular to those types of communities. So I, I put that marker down now so that as we engage in this conversation next year, uh, we are more mindful of some of those land use and fiscal realities um, and start thinking a little differently, not only for the, the students that need those facilities, but because of the realities on the ground. Um, and our uh, changing and evolving community. Um, before I turn it back over to the, the chair for final comment, uh, I do want to recognize school board member Lynn Harris, uh, who is here joining the conversation as well. Uh, chair Jawanda. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and uh, appreciate the comments of colleagues, uh, and it, I think, demonstrates how serious we all take the need here. And um, uh, as we uh, consider the full CIP, um, we understand the needs. So uh, just to, as I said, we had retained for further consideration those, those three projects um, and accepted the other cuts, uh, but did not accept the ADA cut and appreciate Dr. McKnight and Board President Silvestri and our staff and the whole MCPS and OMB team. Yeah, thank you all for being here and turn it back over to you, Mr. President. Uh, appreciate the conversation. Um, not an easy conversation, uh, but one that we will continue forward. Uh, as noted in, in our own committee uh, in, the, in the next few weeks, uh, but certainly in, uh, into the future, and uh, we will have a, 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 an even more robust conversation next year when we take the totality of MCPS's CIP into account. Uh, and not seeing any other comments, we will... Uh, yes, OMB. Good morning, Veronica Howell from the Office of Management and Budget. I just want to remind Council that um, for the cost increase in the HVAC project, um, ESSER funds could be used to fund um, to replace GEO bonds, since this uh, project is funded with the state aid and GEO bonds, um, and ESSER guidelines uh, allow that. So it's just a reminder. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. McGuire. I, I can just add briefly that um, certainly uh, the Education Committee is going to take, begin its work on the MCPS uh, operating budget tomorrow. Uh, and as a part of that conversation, the ESSER funding is a very significant part of that conversation. Um, we'll be talking about those allocations generally, and certainly the committee can keep in mind that, um, that as um, Ms. Chawa pointed out, that's an eligible um, expense, and we'll need to look at those. That's one example of the intersection between the operating and capital budgets. The federal government has uh, provided great flexibility for the use of those funds, and we will engage in that conversation. So thank you for, for bringing it forward. Uh, and so with that, uh, we will support without objection. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. McKnight, uh, President Silvestre, and your entire team. Colleagues, we are now moving on to legislative day number 13 uh, with the introduction of bills. First, we are going to introduce Bill 2223, Transient Lodging Facilities, Short-Term Residential Rental. The lead sponsor is the council president at the request of the county executive. A public hearing will be held on June 13th at 1.30 p.m. and a Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee work session will be scheduled for a later date. Ms. Nadu, good morning. Good morning, Council. 
So Bill 2223 will amend the provisions for short-term residential rental. Um, this is where in the county code we find what we refer to as our Airbnb provisions. Some of the changes being made are reassigning enforcement responsibility to DHCA, increasing the maximum penalty, changing the application process, and clarifying the process for challenges, suspensions, revocations, and appeals. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, oh, Councilmember Jawanda. Just uh, wanted to briefly say, you, this might sound somewhat familiar, but it's different in that, but it would have an impact uh, on, uh, this is, is this the bill that also, yeah, changes where, who enforces? So the short-term residential bill that Councilmember Lukey and I and, and Councilmember Sales and Mink are co-sponsors of, uh, this would impact that. So just wanted to throw that out there. We had been in touch with the county executive and his team about this, and this would and maybe Mr. Dew, if you want to add anything, but just wanted to flag that for folks. Yes, so um, it was mentioned actually during the work session on the Sharing Economy Rental Bill and ZTA that this is a separate but similar um, group of legislation. So I suspect the committee will, or the joint committee, will look at both to make sure that the county is doing both regulatory procedures consistently. There are now two pieces of legislation before the body regarding short-term uh, short-term rental. Very good. Uh, thank you. So that piece of legislation is introduced, and we will now sit as the district council for the introduction of zoning text amendment 2304, residential uses, short-term residential rental. The lead sponsor is the council president at the request of the county executive, and a public hearing will be held on June 13th at 1.30 with a planning, housing, and parks committee work session to be scheduled at a later date. Ms. Nadu? So, as sometimes happens, we have a bill and a ZTA, so some changes in county code. These are the changes that will be in the zoning ordinance for the short-term residential rentals. Um, the changes being made here are requiring the dwelling unit to be the property owner's primary residence, limiting the number of overnight guests regardless of age, and removing some language about owner-authorized agents. Um, and of course, this would be looked at with the previously introduced bill. And that ZTA is introduced. Uh, and now, as District Council, we go to an action item regarding a resolution to approve Planning Board Regulation 2522, Administrative Procedures for Development Review. Uh, Planning Housing Parks Committee recommends approval. Ms. Nadu, do you have anything else you want to uh, nothing to add here other than the administrative procedures for development review were adopted in 2017. So what this uh, regulation will do is it will correct and clarify some language mostly based on changes that have been made both in the zoning code and the subdivision regulations. For example, adding biohealth priority campuses um, and other uh, forest conservation plan changes, updating timelines. Um, so the resolution is to adopt that regulation from planning board. Very good. This is a hand vote to all those in favor, and that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nadu. And we'll move on to the consent calendar. Can I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Second. Uh, moved, uh, moved by uh, Council Member Albernaz, seconded by Council Member Sales. All those in favor of the consent calendar? And that is unanimous. And with that, colleagues, we will be in recess until 1.15 this afternoon. Have a good morning. <laughs>